Hello and welcome! This interview is a special one, featuring Karen Lafferty, a dear friend of mine, and the songwriter of the famous hymn, Seek Ye First, which was printed in hymnals and sang all across the globe. It is a beautiful song. I hope you enjoy this interview as we talk about her life as a musician and songwriter traveling the globe, and her new book, Seek Ye First, link in the description for you to check it out, and I'm excited to share this one with you. Well, welcome to Never Drop Your Sword podcast, where I get to talk to the creatively courageous about what is the one thing that keeps them going in their art and dive into their story just a little bit. And today I'm joined by singer, songwriter, musician, missionary, world traveler, author. Oh gosh, we could go on and on about all the different <laughs> things you've done. Uh, Karen Lafferty, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. We're in your beautiful home. Um, I am very familiar with you. We've known each other for a while, but um, many people that will be listening do not. So please just kind of tell us who you are, what you do, and about your artistic journey just a little bit. Okay, well, um, I'm from Alamogordo, New Mexico. I'm a New Mexico girl just yep. like you. And uh, yeah, we say people like us, we got green chilies running through our veins, you know. Yes. And, um, but, and I'm glad to be living back in New Mexico after many things of going all over the world and everything. But you know, from very early on, I knew music was my deal. Mm -hmm. At first I thought it might be sports, but then thinking about it, uh, I thought I can probably do music longer. Okay. Uh, and so anyway, I, I started music, uh, you know, six years old, uh, was able to take piano lessons and uh, had to beg my mom to do that because she had already been through three children who I'll quit, and she said, I'm not going to waste money on another kid, you know, right. but uh, I said, I really want to. Anyway, and so my mom, though, was one of my best encouragers through the years, and she made a whole scrapbook of my oh. career, you know, and um, so then took up other instruments. First, it was ukulele, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, then guitar when I was 12, saxophone when I was nine, and oboe when I was 14, and just kept going, and I ended up... Um, going to Eastern New Mexico University, okay. which I'm very grateful for, great school, and um, uh, majored in choir directing oh, wow. okay. to teach school, which right. I never did. <laughs> because I got into a nightclub entertaining during my college years and thought, you know, I think I want to try this before I settle down and right. get into school teaching. And so, um, yeah, I, I did that a few years. And while I was an entertainer uh, in New Orleans, um, of all places, too. Uh, I was kind of sowing my oats a bit. And uh, <laughs> even though I was raised as a, as a Christian and in church and all that, and I was a believer, but um, a friend of mine came and uh, just started really showing me what walking with the Lord daily was about. Mm. And I got real hungry for what she had. Oh, wow. And uh, so when I was down in New Orleans, I really prayed and said, God, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Everybody hates hypocrites. You know, right. I'm either going to like really do this or really not. But you know what? I believe this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to get serious about it. And it was in 1970, when right after I graduated from college, that uh, I did that and uh, changed my act actually all right away. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, I mean, just I still, there was plenty of songs. Um, you know, as an entertainer, I thought, I really need to like look at people, see who they are. Yes, yeah, yeah, they got lives, you know, and and I I started doing that more and um but I took just some of the risque songs out of my um uh repertoire and uh, there was plenty of good songs to do. Just right. about life, about fun, uh, about relationships and so, you know, uh, changed my and and actually as as I became a more committed Christian started you know one of the first things I did I thought okay everybody has so many uh, questions like where did the Bible come from how can we trust it right. so one of the first things I did was um, apologetics okay yeah I just started studying Josh McDowell and finding out where the Bible came from and right. all of that and that I could trust it and. Um, so that was fascinating to me. I was, well, that's just such a huge part of your foundation that's going yeah. to, if you're going to live your life by the Word of God, then you have to be able to know where it comes from, how that's it right. translates, how it's lasted for so long, but also it's the foundation. So 
choosing, especially if you're arts and entertainment, which mm -hmm. you're constantly being bombarded to really are. fit in another kind of box or change all these different aspects about yourself. Uh -huh. If you don't know where you're standing, I mean, you're just gonna get swept. Yeah. So that's, that's cool that you took it upon yourself. Yeah. I, I did a similar thing with growing up in a wonderful Christian home, all these sort mm -hmm. of things, but I really wanted to understand my faith for myself yeah. and really be able to say that, yes, I can trust the Bible, I can trust mm -hmm. it, and, and dove into that. So you, you took time doing that, you changed your act, and then what kind of transpired from there, from that point? Like? You know, I, uh, my friend who kind of got me right with the Lord, um, at that time, again, 1970, uh, there was, she knew as a musician, she said, there's a music week going on with Campus Crusade for Christ oh, okay. in California. Yeah. So California, yeah. So, so <laughs> right. we went to that, and you know, I tried out. I had a degree in music. I had, I entertained professionally. I did not even make finalist. Oh. And I think the reason was because they asked me, so would you serve in any other area besides music if we don't have a place in the music ministry? I said, well, no. Uh, I mean, I'm a musician. <laughs> That's right, what yeah. I'm born to do. And um, so, huh, she won't serve anywhere else. And then they said, and could you go, come on staff right away? I said, no, you know, I've, for years I've, I've entertained at this little um, place up in the mountains called the Incredible, right. you know, right at the edge of Mount of Alto Village there. And I said, I have a following back there. I need to let these guys know what's gone on in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to entertain in the bar one more, at least one more year right. or one more summer. And, um, and also I've uh, won a local, I was Miss South Central New Mexico right. from Ruidoso. <laughs> and, um, and I went uh, to uh, Hobbs to Miss New Mexico pageant. And I said, I need to be in the Miss New Mexico pageant. She wants to be a beauty queen. Uh, and so anyway, yeah. they didn't even <laughs> they didn't consider, consider me. Yeah. But um, you know what's interesting? When I went to that Miss New Mexico pageant, by that time, you know, I was really looking at others. And it's, it's so competitive, you know, mm -hmm. that thing. And um, I said, you know, I'm, I know everybody's nervous about this. I'm just going to try to be friends with right. these different girls. And that's what I did. I approached it real differently. Right. I didn't win. I got first runner up. Nice. But, um, but I got Miss Congeniality. Oh, nice. <laughs> this was, is Miss Congeniality it, right it here. That fits your personality. I would just pay attention to people, people and how they were doing and all of that instead of being competitive. Do you think that's why, like, because it's, it's interesting playing music in in bars versus playing in a lot of Christian settings. Mm -hmm. Like one of the major differences is that in a bar, yeah, there's a time to like go and greet and talk to people, mm -hmm. converse with them from the stage. There's not the same kind of pretext as there is playing music in a church or for a function where there seems to be a bit of a barrier, you know, because mm -hmm. you're either there to like lead people into worship mm -hmm. and so they're, you're not meant to banter with them. Do you think that was why you enjoyed playing the bar so much was because of that relationship? Yeah. You could well, do? probably I've always approached both the same way. Yeah. Because yeah. people are people. I've been in church long enough to know there's a lot of sinners in church. <laughs> oh. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, it's more like a hospital, yes. you know, and like we go there because we're sick, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so I, I really approach them the same way. In fact, after my concerts, I always would uh, make time. I'm not doing so many concerts anymore. Right. It's more worship leading, but um, I always would make time to just really talk to people. And, and I learned some important from, remember Corrie Ten Boom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was an uh, incredible woman and and I actually got to meet her uh, oh, out right. in California. She was speaking at Calvary Chapel where I was involved with out there. And, and I went up to her afterwards. And she'd tell all these stories. She has all of these stories that have spiritual lessons. And, um, and she said, Karen, do you have any black and whites in your life? You know, and yeah. it's like, um, it's like it meant, do you have anything where you haven't really forgiven somebody? where you're, you have the evidence against them mm. in black and white, oh, and you're wow. going to kind of hold that back in case you need it mm -hmm. later. And I said, oh, I don't, do I have things that I haven't forgiven people about? And it taught me that even at concerts, somebody will come up and want to talk about your guitar or guitar strings mm -hmm. or something, and um, just let them do that you know, for a while, but then say, 
well, you know, was there any song that spoke to you? Mm -hmm. You know, how are you doing personally? Yeah. And try to get to that personal place. And people want to talk about that, but they don't know how, how? to the beautiful thing about music being such a universal language yeah. whether you understand the words that are being sung or not the fact that you can relate how much it moves you emotionally mm -hmm. now we were kind of talking about earlier before we started you know when and how to trust emotions mm -hmm. and as a creative and as an artist so much of our life because we are wanting to transcribe our emotions through song, writing our mm -hmm. own songs or, yeah. or writing them for the Lord or whatnot. And we also want that personal connection with people. That's the point, you yeah. know. But we can oftentimes get very overwhelmed by our emotions. So like artists and many people, but artists specifically ride a very brutal roller coaster yes. of like, I'm great, I'm terrible, I'm great, I'm terrible. Yeah. And, and you go through all of that. So when going through your, your life, and dealing with those emotions. So first tell me kind of some healthy habits that, that you've developed about dealing with your own personal emotions. Um, as an artist, kind of specifically, what, yeah. what keeps you from struggling with imposter syndrome? Well, or? First, first of all, I'd say, you know, emotions is a real gift. Uh, it's like anything else used in the right way. You know, God has a way. God gave us emotions because he wants us, I mean, God is love, you know, love <laughs> right. has to be emotions, you know, yeah, and, and so um, I, I just think that has, like everything else in our lives, has to be uh, geared in the right way, and so uh, music is emotion, music without emotion is pretty boring, it is, you know, <laughs> and so we got to have, and that's one of the things, I do a lot of music schools, and I, I try to say, okay, own this song so you can give it to people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got to, you know, look at them and give it, give it to them. Because I, I believe singers and, and songwriters, um, um, we're here to write the hearts of everybody. Mm -hmm. you, know, they, you, you know, you hear a song all the time that says, oh man, I could have written that song. Right. That's For my me. song, yes. you know. And, and it's, it's precious to do that. And I've, um, uh, my song, Seek Ye First, you know, um, which I wrote way early, um, just when I was first going into ministry, because I had a, a financial crisis, and I went to church, and they they uh, uh, gave me. Uh, well, anyway, they were teaching out of uh, Matthew six, and and when I heard that verse, I thought, wow, I need to remember that, and just wrote a tune to it, and mm -hmm. rest is history, kind right. of. But um, but yeah, when 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 people realize. Um, yeah, I, I need to, to have that direction. I need to, mm -hmm. I need some guidance in this and, and all of that. So anyway, I think the emotion and what we can write in songs, um, uh, lyrics are so important. You know, the, the music, of course, you know, enhances it all works together, you know. Right. But at the same time, those, those lyrics that speak people's hearts are just so important. And... Um, so we need to do it, and I'll tell you, some of the songs I was writing early on, I thought, oh my, this is about, you know, my own personal, this is too personal, can I sing this in front of people? Yeah. But as I got brave enough to do it, I got so much response to it. Right. Like, I wow, I have felt just like that, you know. Yeah, and people, so, anyway, it's really yeah, important. People crave that genuineness, that authenticity. Do. do you think that there's um, such thing as bad lyrics? Yes, I do. I think uh, songwriting, I think we get there our inspiration. Like right now, I mean, I shouldn't even say this because somebody's going to go out there and write a great song called this. But I'm, I'm wanting to write a song called On This Side of Heaven about just, I hope I see you one more time on this side of heaven. You know, just about our relationships and the importance of that. But um, songwriting is a skill. And so, uh, and that's one of the things, I'll tell you what, I cried the first time somebody really critiqued some of my oh, things, yes, they, yes. and they showed me, um, it was when I was recording already with Maranatha Music, but they said, okay, we're getting ready for your next project, but let's make sure your songs are strong. Mm -hmm. And so they were kind of critiquing my songs, saying, well, you know, and here's, gave me some examples by James Taylor and all that. I thought, I'm not James Taylor, you know, <laughs> right. uh, you know, I'm just me. But, you know, I got over that. 
And that's the way I teach songwriting now. I say, look, the inspiration and all of that can be there, but don't say, God gave me this song. You know, maybe he gave it to you because he's throwing it away, you know? <laughs> um, but no, God gives you the inspiration, but songwriting is a skill. It's a skill. And there's ways we can say things, and some ways will communicate stronger than other ways. So we need to be open to critique. We do, we do. Critique yeah. is very important. And that too, I think can help make or break some of those emotions that we can trust or not trust mm -hmm. when, do, when creating art. Um, because like we've been saying, you know, you put a lot of your emotion, your intention, yourself, <clears throat> And then you got to go out there and perform it in front of people. Yeah. And sometimes people can be very receptive. You know, they look at your heart and they're like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Thanks. You know, and some people don't even be like, I don't care about that. <laughs> and so how have you dealt with a lot of those kind of disappointments? You said that you worked through those critiques. How did you work through them? Did you just determine like, okay, I'm going to trust this person's perspective? Because mm -hmm. art is so subjective. So, yeah. I mean, what's just for your own personal self, like what are some kind of things that, that you've helped work your work through those critiques? You know, it was just each situation. And, and like when they would say, um, you know, this just, it's too monotonous. It gets mm -hmm. boring. Like I had that with one of my um, uh, songs. Which one was it? Well, I know in the land of no goodbyes, um, it was just too long at first. And so I got with a couple of friends, the, my producer, which was uh, Peter Jacobs, who was in an early group called uh, Children of the Day. Mm -hmm. And he, re he produced a couple of my, and a guy named Roby Duke. Roby was an incredible guy that was kind of a jazz, um, he, we went on tour together a little bit, but he was a great songwriter too. And uh, so we just sat down and said, okay, here's this song. And you know, it got, turned upside down and we they kept the elements but it, yeah. it you know the back became front and everything and I thought oh my gosh and I don't remember my original because oh, wow. <laughs> it was just so and I guess you just learn after you get some input and you truly see because as a musician you can kind of tell yes yeah. you know yeah, and and you can like yeah this song's a lot stronger than it used to be mm -hmm. there's a Christmas song I did a while back in a, one of my favorite songwriters, Bob Bennett, uh -huh. um, ended up helping me with those lyrics a little bit. And he said, you just say Christmas too many times in this song. <laughs> I said, oh yeah, I just see what, I can say Yuletide, I can say, say other yeah. ways of saying it. And so I changed it around. And again, it's become a really strong song. I haven't recorded it yet, but, right. but uh, I hope to. And it, it um, but anyway, I've just learned by the fruit of it, yes. really just seeing, mm, yeah, this song's a lot stronger than it was over there. Right, mm. and you know, that's an interesting thing. So you, you've come from such a, a, an amazing stretch of decades where, mm. you know, you, you started up in like the Jesus movement and like when Christian music really kind of became its own industry yeah. in, in the mm -hmm. 70s and then continued on. Mm -hmm. And then you've also branched off and helped um, you know, independent artists, you've mm -hmm. worked with people who've worked on labels and you, you've kind of, the Maranatha group was basically a label for yeah, your music. Mm -hmm. So you've done that and then now you produce your own music. Yeah, because, well, frankly, when I went into missions and moved to Holland, um, <laughs> I wasn't staying around. And also at that point, Maranatha was going through a metamorphosis. They were at first an artist uh, thing. In the early days, our first albums, Mary... Maranatha, one, two, and three, four, five, six, I think right. we had six, um, were a compilation albums of artists, okay. singer-songwriters. Sure. Yeah. And then uh, I was on, Seeky First was on our very first one, and that was oh, in 1974. Wow. And, um, uh, and it was in one of our fellowships, and they just said, did you notice a lot of people are not only writing kind of evangelistic kind of songs, but we're, we're starting to write songs of praise and worship praise. to the Lord and, and we're singing them before we do Bible studies. Why don't we put one album together just with praise songs? Okay. 
hadn't been done before. Yes, Can you yes, believe that? Yes, yes. And, and um, so we did that, and it was called the Praise Album. We didn't know we were going to do like <laughs> hundreds like, more. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Seeky First was on that, and I think that's how it got to be known worldwide. And everybody was so excited. I can put on my cassette in my car and just, and just worship, worship as I'm driving down the road. Yeah. And uh, so that whole phenomena, and Maranatha became a worship uh, and so we were the Maranatha singers. We were right. just a bunch of singers that got in there and sang all these praise songs. Right. And people wanted to book us, but we weren't a group. Oh, <laughs> you know, right. we, yeah, we were just a bunch of singers yeah. doing the, the uh, studio session there. But um, so anyway, so at that time, it was when I was going to Holland anyway. So they really weren't doing singer-songwriters anymore. Okay. And so I thought... I know how to do this. I've been in the studio a few times, so I just started raising money and yeah. and just doing it myself. So doing it yourself. And do you find that, you know, because independent artists and, and books, movies, music has all taken off. It's such a big thing now. All of us mm -hmm. can can actually afford to be completely independent because all yeah. the, we can learn the skills, we can run all those. We can get it out there. We can get YouTube it out there. Yeah, whatever, exactly. Yeah. And the challenge is, of course, to get people to listen and to hear it because there is so much you mm -hmm. know and break through the noise i wonder sometimes if if you've noticed this that with indie artists you know we can get very insular to where we're not seeking out professional advice mm. you know we can kind of be in our own bubble do you, i mean do you do you see that mm -hmm. do you think that's why some people struggle getting their music or their art heard or seen? I, I do and it's why we started schools but very honestly I because I thought um, when, the way kind of an overarching thing that I teach in the schools I say okay if you're going to be in music ministry mm -hmm. I said there's several areas you need to become professional in by right. the way the word professional it it really means to be skilled and knowledgeable about something doesn't necessarily mean to be get paid Oh, but but it, but it needs to be you need if to be professional in something you need to be skilled and knowledgeable. Right. So what areas do you need to be skilled and knowledgeable about? Well, music, right. duh. You know, <laughs> uh, spiritually. You know, you need to know the word. You need to know how to. You need to know about the music business. Yes. You know, and so we would teach. Um, uh, you know, we would teach how to book tours, mm -hmm. you know, how to go in the studio. We would yeah. make an album with our, mm -hmm. our uh, musicians. And so they would get some studio experience. I said, all of those things, if you're going to be full time in this, you have to have all of these things. Yes. And you need to become professional in all of these things. Yeah. But, uh, but I said, one thing, if you don't have this out, down, forget the rest of them. And that's that you have to know how to get along with people. <laughs> yes. If if your character and all of that, if you're hard to work with and all that, it's going to spread around, and you need to learn. You do because in the end, our art is for people. Yes. You know, we all have a calling, a, some kind of internal thing that we want to express. You know, in today's society, people will educate young artists to just express yourself express yourself yeah. you know it's all about you you know yeah. you're wonderful the way you are right yeah. what right what's on your heart your heart is perfect blah, blah blah and we know that our hearts are very flawed that we are not perfect that actually Absolutely. you know and arts and entertainment and entertainment will teach you that very quickly because you get humbled on stage in front of people and you have to work through and learn a lot mm -hmm. very quickly i have to say because of what you said before i've had a hard time getting especially American young artists mm -hmm. to come to our schools. Oh, because they, they learn guitar pretty good, the way mm -hmm. I learned it, yeah. listening to CDs, you know, yeah. and just, and they, they've kind of learned their skills, they've learned, but they really don't have the whole thing down. Right. Yeah. But they, they kind of think they're there. Right. And yeah. so very honestly, it's like, why do I need to go to school for this, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I've had a hard time. With, um, and I, yeah, I think that's a, a big part of it is because we are, we kind of puff ourselves up so much. And I notice that a lot of indie authors, indie musicians, won't take the time to, mm -hmm. to seek out some professional advice because yeah. they are afraid of critique, you know? And then a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, if people don't like what I've written or made, they don't have to listen to it. Yeah. And it's like, well, you put it yeah. out there for them to listen. And I mean, yeah. yes, people can move on and everything's categorized and all these subgenres and everything. But in the end, you know, we are making noise 
hopefully a joyful noise for mm-hmm. other people to hear. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, with that, who do you make art for? Who's your music for? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, and it depends. I mean, I, I want my motivation to be, you know, for God. Mm-hmm. But, but his heart, I just want to have his heart and look at people. You know, Jesus looked at the crowd and he said, you know, he had compassion. And that's, I want to look at people like that. And he said, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Mm-hmm. So that means that even though I wanted my motivation to be for him, and by the way, that was such a release because then it wasn't competitive against what's that female artist over there doing, right. I'm competing. You know, I just, I really got over that and mm-hmm. I don't care. I, I'll, you know, fan their flame. I right. love to see them um, being successful too. And, and it's not a competition anymore. And, um, but, but that said, I, I, I just, I want to have God's heart for people, and then I can really be a better listener, mm-hmm. which is, I'm, I'm a real talker, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I need to learn to listen to more listen. sometimes. Stick around, because there is going to be a part two with Karen Lafferty, where we really get to discuss some interesting and deep, beautiful things that she has learned that she got to express through her book, Seek Ye First. I hope you check out the description in the link below, listen to the song, and tune in again for part two of the Karen Lafferty interview. Stay courageous.